Hey team, Dr. Jack Orty here, and today I'm going to be taking you through an antibody ELISA. Now, this is an ELISA that they use clinically and in research to measure the levels of an antibody that binds to a specific antigen in people's blood or tissue or plasma, for example. Um, so a great example of this would be trying to measure how much antibody that you have that would specifically bind to SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Now, an important thing to note about this um, assay is that it's relative, not absolute. So we cannot tell you how many picograms of antibody you've got in your blood, for example. Um, but what we could tell you is that maybe the vaccinated group of people have as many antibodies that bind to the spike protein as people who have had SARS-CoV-2. And both of those are relatively way higher than people who have never had either, right? So we can talk about relative differences, not absolute differences. So let's jump into it now. The first thing you're gonna need is an ELISA plate or a 96 well plate, for example. And so we're gonna look at a well from the 96 well plate uh, from the side right here. So uh, if I draw it, this is just one well out of 96 wells in a 96 well plate. Now, the first thing that you've got to know is this plastic is special. It's not just regular plastic. This plastic is specially designed to stick to proteins. So whatever solution we put in there, um, if it contains proteins, those proteins are going to come down and stick to the plastic. So the first solution that we put in there is going to be um, a solution that contains spike protein. So we isolate or, or the, the, the antigen that we're investigating, right? So if we were doing an ELISA for SARS-CoV-2, we would get purified spike protein. Now this could be recombinant protein, and you might get this from genetically engineering bacteria to pump out the spike protein. So then the E. coli bacteria that have been genetically engineered will now secrete a whole bunch of these spike proteins, and then we can collect what the bacteria have secreted. So now we've got um, a whole chunk of purified what's called recombinant spike protein. So we would put a solution that contains the recombinant spike protein into this ELISA well. And what will happen is because of special sticky plastic, um, these spike proteins uh, will stick to the plastic, right? So here, this is, our, this is how I'm drawing a spike protein. <laughs> they look like little balloons. So the spike proteins are going to go ahead and they're going to stick to uh, the plastic, right? So now we wash out, we wash it out just with a PBS buffer and maybe a little bit of a detergent. So we wash out the solution. So all that we've got left is perfectly adhered spike proteins to the plastic. The next step that we're going to do is we're going to put in, and we've done this before in previous videos, we're going to put in a protein that we don't care about. Um, now, what's typically used is say bovine albumin. So albumin is the most common protein in your blood, um, and it's the most common protein in cow's blood. So if we take cow blood, we filter out everything except for the albumin. So now we've just got this really common, easy to get protein, and this protein we just don't care about. So what we're going to do is we're going to fill the well with a solution of this protein. And the point of doing this is that this plastic right here is still sticky and we want to get rid of that stickiness. So once we put the albumin in, it's going to bind to the plastic in all the spaces that there are no spike protein, right? And it's going to, this block, so this is called a blocking step. I should put some labels. So this is blocking protein, right? So this is a blocking protein. Um, and I'll just label this down here. This is a spike protein here. Spike protein here. Okay, so now we've got our spike protein and all the sticky plastic is now blocked with albumin. So now we can put in the plasma from our patient, right? So we take our patient, we draw their blood, we remove the cellular components, the platelets, the red blood cells, the white blood cells. So all we're left is the plasma. Now in the plasma will be antibodies. Now if this person has been vaccinated, they will have an antibody response and there'll be residual antibodies that will bind to the spike protein or whatever antibody you're interested in will be floating around that blood. So then what will happen is the antibodies 
will bind to the spike proteins because that's specifically designed to do so. So we might get an antibody here. You might get more than one antibody. Oh, that's a terribly drawn antibody. Hang on, I'll try to draw a better one on the next one. <laughs> uh, here we go. Whoop, 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 whoop. There we go. That's much more like an antibody. I'm not an artist, I'm a scientist, right? So now we've got uh, human patient antibodies bind to that spike protein. Now remember, your blood's going to contain a lot of antibodies that will bind to a lot of antigens, but only the antigens designed to bind to the spike protein will bind to the spike protein. Now, an important thing uh, about antibodies uh, is I'll draw it up here. Here we go. This might be an IgG antibody. So here's our antibody here. Now remember, antibodies have a variable region. This is a variable region. And then a non-variable region, right? So this, this part down here. And what that means is this region up here will vary depending on the antibody because this is the binding domain of the antibody. This will vary between each different antibody designed to bind to a different antigen. So if there was an antibody in the blood designed to bind to a flu viral protein, it wouldn't bind to the spike protein. It would have a different variable region so it would bind to something else. So it would wash out of this. It, we, it wouldn't be left in this experiment. But crucially for us, this region doesn't change, right? So if we take human IgG and we inject it into a mouse or a rabbit or a goat, um, that animal will recognize that antibody as a non-self antibody, a, a non-self antigen, right? So the human antibody injected into a mouse will elicit immune response and the mouse will create, for example, an antibody that will bind to the human antibody, right? So we've got a mouse antibody that will bind to the human antibody. And what's really cool about that is it will bind to all human IgG antibodies because they all have the same region here. Um, if it's the same class, subclass of IgG, they will have the same region here, and so a mouse antibody will bind to it. So what we can then do, um, and this depends on a number of different approaches there are a few approaches here but this one we're going to do a color metric one so then the mouse antibody will come along and it will bind to the human antibody so now we've got a mouse antibody that will bind to the human antibody nice and what we will have done previously what we could have done previously is we could have attached. Um, and in this case, I'm just gonna simplify it down to say, let's say there's a single detection antibody. Um, so what could be in, attached to this is an enzyme like horseradish peroxidase. We call that HRP for short. Now, sometimes there's an avidin biotin step in there, which was in my last video. So there might be a, a biotin attached to this antibody and then an avidin attached to the HRP. And then the HRP will bind to the biotin on the antibody. But in this case, I've just drawn an antibody bind straight to HRP, which does happen. You can get HRP conjugated antibodies is what they're called. Now, this HRP, horse radish peroxidase, is an enzyme. And so what we could then do is we do another wash. Typically, in between each of these steps, we wash out all the unbound stuff, right? So there might, there might be some antibody in here. There will be that didn't bind because there wasn't a human antibody to bind to. So then the mouse antibody will just get washed out in the next step. So we have to do a washing step after that. Then what we do is we put in a substrate. Um, now this substrate, one example is called TMB. Um, so we put in a substrate, I'm going to need another color here. We put in a substrate, and this substrate goes from colorless and then gets digested by HRP, well, gets um, a peroxidized by HRP into a colorful um, substrate product, right? So now we can convert loads of this uh, colorless substrate into a colorful product, right? And so in this case, uh, I've converted it to an orangey yellow one. This is common. But, well, first it converts into blue, then we use an acid. Anyway, uh, we can create a colorless substrate into a yellow substrate. 
And so then we can end up with a buildup. And the great thing about this is amplification, right? Each enzyme could do hundreds, thousands of, of these reactions, could facilitate hundreds of thousands of these reactions. So we can end up with lots of these. Uh, and the amount of this colored product is proportional to the number of enzymes, right? So the more enzymes, the, which means the more antibody, which means the more human antibody, the more of these enzymes, the faster this color change will happen. And this is where we get our relative difference to. What we can then do is after this is all done, actually, let's just move over. We'll just move over a little bit. Um, I'm just going to draw, this is now the top view. So this is the top view of a plate. Now say we've got an unvaccinated person here. This is unvaccinated, unvax, and this is vaccinated. I'm using the uh, colloquial term. Uh, so the va vac vaccinated person, lots of the substrate will be created. Lots of the substrate will be converted into a colored product, right? Then what we can do, um, now we now we, you can normally see it with your eyes, but we want to quantify it because we're scientists, right? So we can measure the absorption, right? Now, this is a little bit complicated. The reason why it's yellow is that it absorbs other wavelengths other than yellow. So the yellow light, the reason why it's orangey yellow um, in this assay is that white light will flow through the liquid and all the other colors get absorbed, and the only color that isn't absorbed is yellowy orange, and so the yellowy orange comes out, hits your eye, and it looks yellowy orange. So we measure how yellow it is by shooting a blue light through it, right? So um, if we were to shoot a blue light through it, we shoot blue light, and it would go straight through the well. We actually shoot it from underneath, and it comes up through the well. It's just hard to draw that in this diagram. Um, and on this one, we'd shoot blue light through it, and much less blue light would come out the other side because it, most of it will get absorbed by the yellow. So we can measure this absorbance. We can measure how much blue light did each well absorb to quantify, get a relative number um, of it. And, and, and typical values would be, you know, we might get 0 0.05 absorbance of this. We might get 0 0.85 absorbance of this, right? That might be typical values that come out of the machine. Um, and so this is how we quantify how much antibody you've got for a specific antigen. Um, so this is an antibody assay.